Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Dr. David Starwer. I'm the Associate Dean for Research in the College of Public Health, and I want to welcome you to one of our two events today um, in celebration of National Public Health Week. And this, I have to be honest with you, is an event that, that we're repeating now, and I think this is the third or fourth time that we've done this in the last few years. And we repeat it in large part because our panelists do such an amazing job of, of communicating to our community about new career opportunities. And, um, you know, I think for those of you who are joining us today, and I hope uh, many of you do, many people do, I think this is a great, great opportunity for our students, both at the undergrad and graduate level, to learn about career paths in the pharmaceutical industry. You know, a lot of times people think about big pharma and they don't know what that means, but they think it sounds like a dirty word and they're not exactly sure you know, what types of jobs are there. But the reality is for many of the disciplines represented in our college, this is an incredibly viable career pathway um, that also can be incredibly rewarding. Um, I've had the good fortune throughout my career from time to time to consult with pharmaceutical companies and surgical device companies. And I can tell you um, that even though people will sometimes say that working in pharma is working on the dark side, um, you will end up meeting some of the smartest, ambitious, most talented people that you will ever work with who have the same skill sets as those of us who have, have more academically based careers, but similarly share a passion to make the world a better and a healthier place. Um, so it's my, my absolute pleasure to bring back three colleagues of ours, colleagues and friends at this point, including two of whom are our own alumni, to share with you their experiences and their perspectives about their career paths um, and where they've gotten to where they are and perhaps share with all of you ideas of what you can do next going forward as well. So we're joined today by Matt Phillips. Matt is a senior specialist in the Center for Observational and real world evidence, otherwise known as CORE, but not to be confused with the CORE in our college, at Merck Pharmaceuticals. He holds an MPH in social and behavioral sciences, as well as a bachelor of science degree in public health, both from Temple. And prior to joining Merck, he was a research coordinator at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, where he managed observational and interventional studies focused on the availability of healthy foods in communities. At Merck, he supports the operational aspects of observational and non-interventional non research studies, including the planning and implementation of primary and secondary data collection studies, as well as multiple internal process improvement initiatives. We're also joined by Alex uh, Kuchurik. Alex is a study manager also in the core center uh, at Merck and specifically supports the pharmacoepidemiology department. She holds a master's degree in epidemiology as well as a BS in public health, both from Temple. And prior to her appointment at Merck, she was a senior research associate at our core, our Center for Obesity Research and Education, where she worked with Dr. Jennifer Fisher for five years, managing observational and experimental studies focused on childhood eating behavior. Um, in her current position, Alex works directly with the scientists coordinating uh, all aspects of observational and non-interventional research studies, which include both operational planning and implementation of primary and secondary data collection. And a third member of our panel is, is Claire Fox. She's also a senior specialist in CORE at Merck, and she holds an MPH in epidemiology from NYU, as well as a bachelor's in neuroscience and psychology, both from Allegheny College. We will not hold it against her that she is not a Temple alum, uh, <laughs> because she's also joined this panel and, and become a great, great friend of ours. Um, Prior to joining Merck, Claire was a bench biologist at a startup pharmaceutical company, as well as an environmental health epidemiologist in the Philadelphia Department of Health, where she worked on childhood lead exposure surveillance and programmatic intervention. At Merck, she supports a variety of non-interventional research studies spanning the areas of oncology, women's health, antivirals, and methodological development. So with that, I am gonna turn things over to them because they do a phenomenal job with this panel and are gonna show you some of the coolest infographics you've probably ever seen. Um, but I'm gonna come back as we moderate the question and answer session towards the end. So if you have any questions for our panelists, and I really encourage you to take advantage of their knowledge and experience and expertise, 
please post them in the, the question and answer bar. Um, and then I'm be happy to share them with the panelists as we get towards the end. So with that, Matt, I'll turn things over to you. Thanks so much, David. And thanks for that fantastic introduction. I feel like you set the bar kind of high for this. So I hope we are able to <laughs> deliver here. Um, <laughs> so like David said, I'm just gonna kick things off. So real quick, just review the agenda for the, the talk today. Uh, the three of us are going to go through our introductions and highlight some of our key career milestones to date. I think David did a, did a good job of describing the work we do now, but we think we, it's important to share sort of how we got to where we are. So we'll go through that. Then we'll talk a little bit about the work that we do at Merck. What is non-interventional research? What is outcomes research? Uh, dig in a little bit to that and talk about our specific roles, because although we're all in the same department, um, we all have slightly different functions and contribute to the work in a little bit of a different way. And then Alex will share some examples of public health and pharma, just to give you some real world, real life examples of the work that we're doing at Merck um, and how we think it's like really traditional public health style research. We'll, you know, the whole purpose of this talk is to share some advice and our insights. So, you know, we wanna make sure some time to share some key things, some key pieces of advice with you all. And then as David said, we'll leave some time for Q and A at the end. So without, Anything further, I'll kick it over to Alex and she's going to walk us through her uh, career milestones to date. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, David. Um, as Matt said, my name is Alex Katurak. Um, I'll be walking you through my key milestones and how I got to this place in my career over time. So before we get into it, I want to say that this um, slide, which I'll walk you through, is a little bit busy looking. It appears very linear. As you can see, that's a straight line there. And as we were building this presentation, we thought it was important to point out that, you know, Claire, Matt, and I all had very success paths to get where we are in our career, and it wasn't as straight as this appears. Um, I know that I attend a lot of talks that are similar to this one, and I always see this straight line, and in some ways, it's so frustrating to me because I'm like, how do they know exactly what they need to do to get to where they are now? And as I'm learning um, through my own career and, and in discussions that I've been having, it's, it's not quite that straight. So I just like to put that out there before I get started. So everything that you see in the blue icons is related to my um, education. Everything in yellow is related to my career and everything in the darkish gray color is related to my personal life. And again, we thought it was really important to include all three types of milestones because, you know, all of these factors contribute to how we make our decisions and really influence the decisions that we do make. So to walk you through some of my key milestones, I started at Temple University as a um, business major in 2009. Um, after a semester of some business classes, I decided that wasn't the right fit for me. Um, so I've always had an interest in nutrition, but at that time, Temple didn't have any um, major specifically focused on nutrition. So I thought public health most, aligned, most closely aligned with what I was interested in. So I switched my major to public health in 2010. Um, in 2013, when I was approaching graduation, I was completing an internship at the Center for Obesity Research and Education, which is CORE, um, David's group. And I was really struggling at that time. Sorry if you hear beeping outside, um, construction trucks. Um, at that time, I was really struggling with if I wanted to complete a master's full time or work full time. And at that time, my, my boss, Jenny Fisher, offered me a full time position at CORE. Um, and I was accepted into the master's and FE program at the same time. So I decided to take on both and work full time while I completed my master's part time. So over the course of the next several years, um, I was working on various different observational and experimental studies, um, trying to understand children's eating behaviors and, and parental influence on those eating behaviors. Um, I graduated with my master's degree in FE in 2015 and was prom promoted to a senior research associate um, around the same time. I stayed in that role for about three more years and I got to a point where, you know, I was, I was itching for something new. I had, you know, it was really all I knew was working at CORE and it was a really great experience, but um, I knew that I needed to make a decision um, because without a PhD in academia, you do hit the ceiling relatively quickly. So at that time, um, I did have an interest in the pharmaceutical industry, and Matt had reached out to me. He was already at Merck, letting me know there was a position available within his department. So I applied, I interviewed, I actually didn't get it, um, but it really triggered my interest in working at Merck because I had really good conversations with those that interviewed me. 
Um, so a few months later, another position opened. I was encouraged to apply again. Um, and then I interviewed and accepted that position as a study manager. So I was a study manager for about two years and more recently took a position as a quality manager. Um, and I'll get into what that means a little bit later in the presentation. So with that, I will turn it over to Claire. Great, thank you, Alex. Um, so again, similar to Alex, this looks like a very clear line, um, but I can assure you this was not a clear path and after a lot of agonizing, <laughs> on uh, which decision was best. That's how I've ended up where I am today. Um, I started my academic career as a neuroscience and psychology bachelor's um, undergrad. And when I graduated, my initial thought was that I would stay in academia um, studying these very tiny cellular, um, microcellular ion channels. Um, because I had this very specific interest, I had focused on jobs that were on a bench scientist type of role. And I was lucky enough to get a job at a startup biopharmaceutical company that was roughly 25 people um, at the time, but had the largest phase three study for ALS Lou Gehrig's disease um, at, in, during the time when I was part of the company. And through the experience of working as a lab scientist while getting to see the inner workings of a small company um, conducting a clinical trial, I realized I had a huge interest in uh, clinical trials, pharmaceuticals generally, and finding ways to impact um, different patient populations with life-saving treatments. And so when I realized that um, around the 2013 timeframe, I went on to pursue my master's of public health at NYU. Um, I knew that I needed to work at the same time so I could live in New York City. And so I worked full-time um, at NYU's library while getting my degree part-time. Um, I did graduate from NYU in 2017, and the time in my master's program really sparked my interest in the traditional public health um, research type of job. And I really focused my job search on the public sector at that time. And so I was lucky enough to get the opportunity to work at the Philadelphia Department of Health um, on the childhood-led surveillance data. Um, I worked in that role for about a year, but really got the itch to get back into this pharmaceutical role, um, focused on new treatments and bringing new treatments to patients that really need them. And I was made aware of the study manager role actually from a contact that I knew from undergrad. So networking gets a bad name, but it really works. Um, I applied for the role, got that role in 2018. Um, and I was recently promoted to senior specialists uh, early 2021. With that, I will hand it to Matt. Sorry, I had to get myself off the mute there. Thanks, Claire. So um, I'm, we sound like a broken record at this point, but it, I just also wanna highlight that although this is a straight line, the journey to where I am today was certainly anything but. Um, I started undergrad at Temple back in 2008, actually as a nursing major. I thought I wanted to do like direct patient care. That's um, where I thought my career was going to go. And then after about two years of taking all the prereqs for nursing school, I thought, no, this isn't, this isn't quite where I see myself anymore. Um, and I actually, actually went into an advising appointment and said, what's the easiest major to change into <laughs> with the classes that I've taken so far? Um, and the advisor said, public health pretty much lines up. And I said, I don't know what that is, but let's give it a shot. Um, so admittedly, a terrible way to pick a major. Um, I don't recommend it to anybody on the call, but luckily enough for me, it worked out. But I haven't really looked back since. Um, so I graduated with my bachelor's in um, public health and then immediately went back to get my master's in public health from Temple also. At that time, I was working as a teaching assistant in the, the university. Um, and during my time at Temple, when I was in grad school, I was also working as a research coordinator at the University of Pennsylvania. When I graduated from there, um, I actually was able to get a full-time job and started working there um, full-time. That role at the time, um, had you asked, I would have said like, this is like my dream job. It was like the job that I pictured when I was in grad school. That's why I went to grad school was to get a job working in food, um, nutrition and like sort of like policy evaluation. And that's exactly what I was doing. And I loved it. I loved the work, but I realized similar to like what Alex said pretty quickly that 
you bump up against the ceiling in those roles pretty quick. And I have no interest uh, in going back for a PhD. So I realized that I, it was time for a career change um, after about a year and a half, two years in that role. I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I, know, I knew that I wanted a new, a new job and a new challenge. Um, and somebody that I knew from grad school, another TA, was working at Merck in a contract position, reached out to me and said, you know, we have this position available on our team. I think you should apply for it. And I laughed it off and said, no, thank you. Um, I didn't go to get two degrees in public health to work at a pharmaceutical company. Um, and I basically told her, no, thanks. And she came back and was like, I really think you should consider it. I also have a couple of degrees in public health and you know, the work we're doing here, it closely aligns with, you know, sort of what your interests are. And I think you would be interested in it. And I said, okay, fine. I'll do it for the interview experience. Literally applied just because I figured I'm going to be applying for jobs anyway. That'll be good interview experience. When I was in on the interview, I was actually really engaged with the people that I was talking to, really interested in the work that they were describing, and realized that most of the people um, in the department have some version of a public health background. So then I was actually really excited about the role and hoped to get it, and luckily enough was offered the position um, in March of 2017. So I actually started as a contractor with Merck, not in a full-time role like Claire and Alex have started, um, and then was lucky to be hired into a full-time role later that year, about seven months or so. After I started, I was offered a full-time position with the company. Since then, I've been promoted to a senior specialist role. So at that time, took on some more process improvement, department level um, initiative type work. And then at the end of last year, I was actually offered um, a stretch opportunity by my management team to start working as a people manager. So now I have a small team of people that report to me um, and I manage them and the work that they do, which has been a really um, exciting new challenge for me. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Alex. We have a small activity that we want to kick off before we proceed with the presentation. So Alex, if you want to introduce this to everybody. Sure. So we want to gain an understanding of all of you in the audience, what your perceptions are about the opportunities related to public health careers in, pharm in, in the pharmaceutical industry. Okay. So we really want everyone to participate. So either using your cell phone or your computer, you can go to www.menti.com, which you can see at the top of the screen there and use the code that's listed in the orange letters. Um, and in just a few words, maybe one to three words max, just enter into the box, what types of jobs do you think are available in pharma? There are no right or wrong answers. Um, we really just wanna get an understanding of what you all think so that we can position our, the rest of our talk accordingly. Um, so as you do this, we'll do this for about 60 to 90 minutes. Um, as you'll see, some people have already submitted some responses, they'll come in on the screen. Um, so just take a few minutes to send those through. And I will just say as a supplement to what Alex um, already mentioned, you know, even though we are representing public health um, professionals in pharma right now, we don't even know all of the careers that are available to us. We have an idea, but I'm constantly researching different career opportunities and different roles that might fit my specific interests. So it's, it's evolving for everyone all the time. Yeah, thanks for saying that, Claire. All right, we have a lot of responses here. So research seems to be pretty big, sales, communication, HEOR, that's a new one. I don't think we've seen that one yet. Yeah. Regulatory affairs. These are great. Market research is on there. Interesting. Commercial forecasting, wow. I'm happy to see the health disparities because I think that's often a misconception that pharmaceutical companies don't always address that. Yeah. Compliance, my people. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this looks great. Yeah. So, so you can continue to submit these responses. They'll continue to come through. And then Matt will add in this um, image to our slide deck that will circulate um, probably later today or at some point to you all. Yeah. So you can continue to submit um, the responses, but I think we're going to switch gears here a bit. Great. Thanks, Alex. So we've talked a bit about our personal career journeys, but this slide and this piece of the discussion is really intended to give you some background information on Merck and what Merck's vision and mission is in the world. Um, Merck is a company of about 70,000 people globally. 
Um, and for more than a century, the company has been inventing to solve some of the world's greatest challenges to people's health and well being. The vision of the company is to make a difference in the lives of people globally through our innovative medicines, vaccines, and animal health products. We're committed to being the premier research intensive biopharmaceutical company, and we're dedicated to providing leading innovations and solutions for today and for the future. Um, the mission that we have in the back of our minds at all times in this company is to discover, develop, and provide innovative products and services that save and improve lives around the world. Um, these are very general statements and give you an idea about the company, why we exist and what we aim to do. But some more tangible items are at the bottom of the screen. So some areas of focus that Merck is primarily um, focused on right now are oncology, vaccines, infectious diseases, cardiometabolic diseases as well. Um, Merck is committed to diversity and inclusion, in both the workforce and in our clinical trials. And that's a really important point to hit home. Um, and lastly, in 2020, our research and development expense budget was 13.6 billion um, on research and development activities. And we really put that there to highlight the fact that Merck is committed to science and to learning more about these disease areas and the products that we can bring to the world um, to make all of us healthier. And um, yeah, I would just say that's something we always kind of hear. Um, I'm sure Alex and Matt can attest to it. Our company is really, really focused on being the premier research intensive biopharma company. And this number kind of um, backs that up. Yeah, and I just I just want to add that I just updated the slide to give this talk today. And when we first put this um, presentation together, we had 2018 data, and then 2019, and now 2020 data, and that number has gone up every year. So just you know, just really illustrating that Merck puts its money where its mouth is, really focused on research. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Claire. Okay, so now to the part of the presentation where we want to talk about our jobs and what we do. Um, so we just spend a quick minute to just give you a little bit of background on what CORE is. So like David said, we all work in this group CORE or the Center for Observational and Real World Evidence. Um, we're all in sort of varying degrees of project management roles um, with a little bit of a different focus though. So in a, in a few minutes, we'll get through like specifics of our roles, but Ultimately, we all go to support um, the non-interventional or observational research that the company uh, conducts. So what does that mean, right? So non-interventional observational research is outcomes research. It's a type of public health research focused on clinical, economic, and humanistic burden um, for patients that we're aiming to serve. So we're looking at things like, um, whoops, there we go. We're looking at things like disease mortality, um, change in the ability to function or patient's quality of life before or after they take a Merck product. What's the burden of disease? So who's getting sick? How sick are they getting? How much does it cost to care for them? Looking at all of those like social um, and economic factors associated with illness as well. So we can help build the case for why um, a, a particular Merck product or vaccine might be useful for a patient population. Um, so at this point, I think it's worthwhile for us to go through and sort of explain what we do every day. Um, we have a typical day looks what what a typical day looks like for us. I think we would all agree that there is no typical day. It's sort of really dynamic and changes on a day to day. That's one of the most exciting things about our jobs is that it's a little we get a little bit of something new all the time. And so what I'll do is I'll ask uh, Alex maybe to kick us off and explain some of the work that she does in the quality space. Yeah, so my role is a little bit different than Matt and Claire. Um, I'm a quality manager. So my role is really focused on the how our research gets done and ensuring that our research gets done in a compliant way um, and really making sure that we have those systems in place to ensure that our work is being done in a compliant way, whereas Matt and Claire more so operationalize that. And they'll explain that a little bit more. Um, so I'm part of our quality management system team. And you know, I would say every organization has some form of quality management system. So what it means is it's an organized framework of processes, procedures, and resources that are really needed to implement, maintain, and constantly improve the management of quality. So for, for my sake, it's the, the quality of our studies is what I am focused on. So one of the large parts of my role is 
working to ensure that our standards are being adhered to and working to train our study teams on our standards. Um, so when I say standards, it's, you know, it, they really provide the step-by-step -step processes for activities that are conducted within core for non-interventional studies to really ensure that all of the, you know, company regulations and policy requirements are met. So in order to conduct non-interventional research within core, there's a number of procedural documents that must be followed. And built into each of those is, you know, the different rules and regulations within our company, as well as, um, you know, the good pharmacoepidemiology practices and the good pharmacovigilance practices to really ensure that our bases are covered and that these stepwise um, documents include all of that. Another part of my role is I'm really involved in our internal audits. Um, so as a regulatory requirement, every pharmaceutical company is required to conduct internal audits. So I work as a partner to both the study teams as well as the auditors to ensure that they're, you know, being conducted in a really smooth fashion. And then based on the audits, if there's any findings, um, I work on the quality improvements from those. So really trying to understand the root cause of what that finding was. Why did it happen? How do we correct for it? And how can we prevent it moving forward? And then I'm also, you know, always monitoring the trends in any quality control findings as well as routine metrics. So really just trying to make sure that our work is being done in the most compliant way um, because science is really twofold. Um, it needs to be both rigorous and compliant. So, um, you know, not only does it need to, we need to be getting data, but we need good data. So that's a lot of what I focus on. So I don't know, Matt or Claire, who wants to go next? I can take it. Okay. Um, great. I love that Alex used the word operationalize um, to describe the roles that Matt and I play um, in some ways within CORE, um, because a lot of the work that I do does involve operationalizing those processes and details that Alex's team um, puts in place for us to ensure that we collect data um, in the right way, we collect data that is um, clean data, data that's good quality and ready for the analyses that we conduct to ultimately get um, the science and, and the, the answer to our research questions ultimately. Um, what do I do day to day? Well, it's a lot, as Matt alluded to, it's never the same. Um, but I would say at a high level, I spend my days managing about 10 different non-interventional studies. Uh, making sure that everything's running on track. We have um, timelines that we're meeting, making sure that the scientist is checking all the boxes that they need to, to check for the different processes that we have. Um, but at the same time, I want to highlight that while what I'm describing sounds a lot like and is project management, the common thread through all of the projects that I work on is the science and the public health the scientists that I work um, directly with, most of them have epidemiology PhDs, and I get an opportunity to see the different scientific protocols that they write, um, get insight into how they design their studies, why they did design their studies in a certain way, um, help kind of get our statistical analysis plans through our different biostatistics groups. So although a lot of the roles uh, project management a lot of the material I touch every day, I would consider, um, you know, public health related. Um, the one other thing I wanted to highlight is that I really love um, this role because it's really about finding creative ways to use existing data. Real world data is data that sometimes and most of the time already exists in the world. And I really love the idea of recycling that data and getting our research questions answered. So Matt, I will hand it to you. Thanks, Claire. That's a really great summary of the job that we do every day. I think, um, you know, my job is really similar to, to Claire um, and that, you know, we're really working closely in lockstep with a lot of the scientists to get the work done, you know, develop the protocols, making sure that they're meeting all of the requirements and regulations that Alex described to make sure that everything's being done in a quality and compliant way. Um, I also, I work mostly with, um, in the vaccine space, so working on vaccines that we're trying to bring to market, um, but most of the collaborators that we work with are external to Merck, so we contract all of our research out. Um, so I work mostly with academic institutions, actually, that are collecting a lot of our disease burden data to, to sort of say, 
that like I was mentioning before, like who gets sick, how sick are they getting, how much time are they out of work for, how much, how long are they in the hospital for, how much does it cost to care for them so that we can develop sort of these economic models to say, if we were to introduce a vaccine into the market for, you know, whatever infectious disease it is, we could prevent this much illness, prevent this much, um, you know, healthcare spending on treating people. So, you know, spend a little bit more upfront on the prevention and you can prevent spending on the treatment down the line. So I know this is pretty common for people. There's a lot of talk about this stuff happening with COVID right now. So um, it's a, a lot of the work that I do is sort of like, has a spotlight on it right now um, because of the ongoing COVID pandemic. So that's sort of half of my job um, is working on the study management side. The other part of my job, uh, now that I'm a people manager, is managing a small team of study managers who are actually also getting this work done. So I spend a lot of my time sort of looking at the work that needs to be supported and the work that needs to get done and looking at the process and the way that we have to do our work, like the, all of the things that Alex's team puts together and then helping my team interpret that so that they can do their job successfully. So working with um, new colleagues on the team to sort of make sure that they are trained up, understand the work and then can execute the work so that we get that clean data, you know, we can show uh, solid outcomes and hopefully get our products on the market so that the patients who need them the most um, can have access to them. All right, so now I think I'll kick it back to Alex. She's gonna walk us through some examples of uh, public health in pharma. Yep. So this slide here is really meant to just further emphasize the role that public health plays in pharma, um, specifically to the work that we're doing at Merck. So as you'll see, there are um, a few different, sorry, there's a few different headlines um, that have been in various different news sources that are related to public health work that we're doing. So first one is related to Brovecto, which is um, was invented, was created for dogs to prevent um, fleas and ticks, and it was expanded for indicate for use in cats. Um, so that was exciting for our furry friends, a public health initiative there. The next one is um, related to Gardasil 9 um, being expanded for use in the, an older population. So as many of you might know, Gardasil 9 was originally um, developed to prevent HPV, and it has since been used to prevent cervical and various other cancers. So this is really exciting that not only has that um, expanded use been approved, but also now for older individuals. I really like to highlight the next one because I think it really just talks, speaks to, you know, Merck's focus on the patients. So it was related to Merck's Ebola vaccine um, being developed. So this vaccine was developed, I think, in 2016. Um, and after it was developed, over 200,000 doses were donated to the WHO for distribution in low and middle class um, countries during the outbreak. So I think it, it really speaks to our mission to putting the patients first. And then finally, the hot topic of the year um, in response to the pandemic, Merck has been in the process of developing a therapy um, for the prevention and treatment of COVID-19. So again, these are, it's, it's just a summary of some of our, um, the work that we've been doing in the news just to you know, really speak to the large part of what we do is public health research. Thanks, so. Al. All right, so at this time, um, we think we, we like to wrap this uh, presentation up with a little bit of advice. We wanna sort of try to give something back to you all. So we call this slide, Things We Wish We Knew Sooner. Um, you know, this is something that I'm sure, all of these things I'm sure have been said to you at some point, they were all said to us when we were um, in your seats, uh, but maybe we didn't pay attention them, to them enough or fully understand how to utilize them. So we're just gonna take the opportunity to highlight them once more for you all. So the first one is network, not just networking. I think we hear a lot about, you gotta network, you gotta network, you have to put yourself out there, you have to meet people, right? And so it's, it's one thing to meet all of these people doing all these great things, but it's another thing to sort of maintain that network and keep up to date. And that's really the important part, right? Because if you, it's one thing to shake somebody's hand and say, hi, nice to meet you. It's another thing to maintain the relationship and then be able to use your network to your advantage. Every one of us on the call today told you that we um, heard about our current positions via somebody that we know that was already working at the company. My former TA, Claire's uh, former classmate, and Alex's former classmate, me, um, you know, we all sort of reached out to our network, people that we knew that were um, interested in roles and said, hey, there's an open position, are you interested? You know, I can 
help connect you to the hiring manager. So not just about jobs, there's lots of other reasons that you might need to use your network. We do it to um, come back to colleges and give this exact talk. We reach out to our networks for that, right? We also work with students that we meet through these um, sort of events and these talks and sort of like mentor them, talk to them about our careers, help them figure out like where they wanna go next. Um, so it's, it's more than just meeting a lot of people, it's using your network and maintaining it to the best of your uh, ability to get something out of it. Yeah, I'll just add there. I think, you know, Matt Claire and I are, you know, we forever will be networking. I think it's just part of having a career. You just need to continue networks and meet new people. And I will admit that sometimes networking feels really forced. Um, it's not always fun. You know, it's just another meeting on your calendar on top of your already crazy workload, but it's really important. And you'll leave those meetings feeling so empowered and, you know, feeling really great, but they do feel forced um, at first, just introducing yourself and making that initial conversation, but it is really, really important. Yep, yep, I, I would agree with everything both Matt and Alex said. I think it's so important and kind of leading into the next bullet point, um, keeping an open mind to new experience ties into that as well. I know very recently I reached out to someone uh, very far outside of my department just to learn more about their role and from that, I could potentially have an opportunity to try something new that's not necessarily in my current skill set, but I think could build a different skill set for me that could um, help benefit my career down the line. So I would just say, you know, the advice here is that if you're not um, experienced in something, don't always knock it um, before you think about trying it and think about the implications of what you would learn from that new experience and how it might play into um, just giving you a more informed decision down the line and what you want to do with your career. Yeah. When I was an undergrad, I vowed I would never have a career in research. <laughs> and that has literally been my whole career. So yeah, it's a really good point. Yeah. Um, the next one is highlighting transferable skills. So you know, for those of you who are applying for positions and starting to look at job um, postings right now, you might notice that you need, you know, entry level jobs, you need some, ex you need a lot of years of experience and you need the degrees. But I think it's really important to pull from other experiences that aren't necessarily traditional. Um, so think about your part time positions you had at a grocery store or as a server um, while you're completing your degrees and pull from those so that you could talk about them during your interviews. Um, I would say if a position says you need one to two years experience and you don't have that traditional, you know, nine to five experience, still apply because you can pull a lot of situations from other circumstances that make you really relatable. Um, you know, Matt and I always joke that we learned how to deal with conflict and we learned time management as our, as we worked as servers throughout our whole um, education. So I think it's really important to think about as you're reading through a job description, you know, line by line, think about what other experiences you can pull skills from to really speak to. Yeah. And then, so just the last thing here is saying no to things. I think people underestimate how much of a skill it is to be able to say, no, thanks, not interested in that. I mean, it's a skill that I work on every day and struggle with uh, every day. Um, but I think it's, we just like to highlight that it's important to think about as opportunities come your way, things are offered to you, you know, think really critically about not just what you can give to the opportunity, but what you can get out of it, right? So if you, it's something that you've done a hundred times and you're really, not, it's not going to help you develop anymore. You don't really have the time to contribute. It's okay to say no. It's okay to turn things down if it's going to stress you out, stretch you too thin, and you're not really, it's not going to contribute to your overall development. It's okay to step back and say, I actually don't have the time to dedicate to that because I, personally, I think it's better to say no to something and, you know, not do it than say yes to it and not be able to give it 100% and then deliver, you know, subpar, not perfect results, right? That would be worse than saying no, I think. So just a reminder that um, it's a skill, work on it and start early um, so that by the time you are a little bit further in your career, you're very skilled at turning things down that maybe um, you don't have the time or uh, um, effort to contribute to. All right, and I think that's it for us. So we will turn it over to you all, see if there's any questions. Um, 
we're, you know, we have some time left, so we're happy to answer anything that comes up. Yeah, well, well, thank you guys again for just another fantastic presentation. I've been getting text messages from um, others in our community have heard you guys do this before. And, you know, I, I can't underscore enough how much of a gift this is to our students to be able to hear your perspectives on how your careers have developed and, and kind of the peek behind the curtain of not only what working for a company like Merck is like, but also the, that beautiful merger of, of what it is you do from a nuts and bolts perspective, you know, how this has fit into the larger narrative of your lives. You know, I think I noticed now that obviously to get a job at Merck, you have to buy a dog first. Um, <laughs> it looks like that's a prerequisite um, from your infographics. But, um, you know, and, and just that last slide that you guys put up, I think is so very important because you know, and, and I still struggle even at this point in time in my career with saying no to things. I think a lot of people do. And you do have to kind of, you know, kind of do the math of does it make sense to do this versus, you know, and, and how does it look in terms of my career development? Is it a personal passion? Do I have some, you know, do I feel like I need to do a favor for a friend? Or is this actually an opportunity where I, I should say, no, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to sit this one out. And I think particularly for early career professionals, that's a really difficult, you know, dance to, to have and to figure out how to pick and choose your spots because you never know who's looking and you never know when you do say no, who might bristle and say, well, Matt's not as motivated as I thought he was. So, so I, I think, you know, it's such, when you guys do this, it really is such a phenomenal gift to, um, to our students. So I obviously can't thank you guys enough. So that was essentially my version of doing show tunes, waiting for some more questions to come in. And they have. Um, I do have some questions for you guys too, but I'm going to save mine for later to make sure that we get to the students' questions. So one question is actually, uh, we, we actually have two pretty um, specific questions um, to get us started. One of which is, is as somebody with an MPH in their background, how often do you actually use SAS for data and statistical analysis? So we don't. Um, Merck has a, a standalone um, statistical analysis group. And so that's outside of the scope of our day to day. But if it's of interest to someone, Merck, like I said, does have that group and they do, you know, they have so many different, I, I can't even speak to it, but it's a great group. So if there right. is interest in statistical analysis, Merck does have a, a, a wonderful um, group. If, you know, and actually, I think the question and your answer, Alex, is is telling in and of itself that, you know, when we think about the, the educational opportunities we provide for our students, we train them to do a whole bunch of different things, including statistical analysis. And we I don't think there's always a full appreciation of that you may go into a role where, you know, SAS but you know just enough to be dangerous, but you certainly don't know as much as the person who was hired to do, you know, to work with SAS 24 seven, and that really your role on a project will be much more defined. Right. And, and that, that actually kind of leads me back to something Claire that you said, which I think is really, really important about how, um, how career development works in a lot of pharma and in, in, in pharmaceutical companies that you really do you know, you may have a discrete project and discrete responsibilities on a given project today, mm -hmm. um, but as as the as the um, you know as the interactive poll you guys put up even illustrated, you know there may be job descriptions and titles and positions five years from now that don't even exist at Merck and and the other pharmaceutical companies in the region because it's that much of a kind of malleable field. So I'm I'm again thrilled that you guys shared all that uh, with our group. Um, the next question is, can you guys tell us a little bit about career uh, career opportunities for persons with a nursing degree? That's interesting. I think, I mean, we do have somebody on our team that has a nursing degree. Sorry, there's like four helicopters flying by my window, so it's a little loud, <laughs> that's why. Um, we do have somebody on our team that has a nursing degree. and I think she started as like a research nurse. So she was working in a hospital on clinical trials and sort of, you know, found her way into industry through that way. I think it's only, as far as I know anyway, only one person 
I do have some colleagues though that I work with that are in like the lead scientist role who started as nurses and then became nurse practitioners and then, you know, sort of grew into research roles and then took, went down that career path um, and ended up in a, a lead scientist role at the company. So I think it's certainly there. Um, it maybe isn't as like clear cut as some of the other positions though. Yeah, yeah, this is clear. Just to build on what Matt said, I know the organization that Alex, Matt and I sit in core um, it's still relatively new. I know we said Merck's been around for 100 years. I, I'm going to give you an estimate. I think CORE's been around maybe close to 10. It might be plus or minus a few years. Um, but there are definitely roles in the clinical groups that would ask for a nursing degree. Um, so if, if you're interested in pharma and using your nursing degree in pharma, I encourage you to go to the Merck Jobs website and, and search for your degree um, in that. Yeah, I know and I, I can, clinical. Yeah, and I can just say from from my perspective as somebody who's consulted with pharma, I've definitely encountered nurses who are working on the science side, more the science side than say the marketing side, but who are in a company. You know, the other place where you find a lot of nurses outside of clinical care is working with insurance companies. That they are oftentimes, uh, it, whether it's insurance plan design, um, whether it's benefit design and implementation. Um, you, see, you find a lot of nurses who, if they've had their fill of clinical care and want to take their careers in another direction, that's often where we'll go. So, so Claire, you talked a little bit about the, this, so I'm going to start this next question with you. Um, and it was actually one that I wanted to ask you guys. Um, can you tell us a little bit about work-life balance? I know the, the four of us were talking about that with Louisa before we started and how very different things have been for the last year and you know, how maybe being at home has got an upside in terms of the time we've gotten back. But Claire, can you start the answer in terms of work-life balance sure. issues for you? Sure. I would say at this point, it, I have a pretty good balance right now. The role that I hold, um, a lot of the work, although I rely on other people for answers to my emails, a lot of it is individual. So I can make my own schedule and get what I need to get done in a certain day. Now, that's not to say that some days are longer than aren't longer than others. Um, there are definitely tight deadlines we reach and times when we need to be flexible. Um, so, you know, with this whole working from home environment in the pandemic, I'll say it's not always easy to draw a line between when work ends and when it starts back up the next day. But I think I've learned over the past year some time management skills and to actually turn my computer off completely. Um, once that clock hits five. So it's, it's manageable with some uh, time management skills I've honed over the last year. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and I just I would add to that, Claire, that the company's done a really good job of prioritizing like our own mental health to make sure that we're not burning out because it is so easy to just, you don't have to leave to like beat the traffic, right? So you're not like running out of your office at 4.30 because you're just walking down the hallway to another room in your house, right? So the company's done a pretty good job of like prioritizing your own time outside of work. So if you've got kids at home or other priorities, you can sort of like flex your schedule now because we don't need to work nine to five anymore because that's not the situation we're in. Um, and I, I mean, I've even had people like if I'm on later than usual, sending emails, reply and go, why are you online? Like log off. You should be done. You stop working. So people in, you know, like our, our bosses and our bosses' bosses are cognizant of that and are encouraging us of us to draw the line, you know, sign off, make sure you walk away for lunch, you know, get outside, take a walk, stop looking at your computer. So it's been really encouraging to see that the company is not just expecting you to sort of like turn and turn and turn until you burn out. Um, they are, really are trying to put a focus on, you know, draw, make sure that you have that clear boundary between your work and your life. So, so we've got a couple of questions related to the role that your MPH degrees have played in, um, in your career. So, so really more two specific questions. Can, can you all comment on which of your courses have you, that, you that you took as part of your MPH degree have been most advantageous in terms of, of where you are now, have been most helpful to the jobs that you have? And then also, can you guys comment a little bit about the pros and cons of, uh, for those thinking about an MPH degree, 
full-time versus part-time, online versus in-person, and, and given our current climate and state of affairs, are those different options viewed in a slightly different light? Yeah, so for the first question in terms of what courses I found to be the most valuable, I would say, which I never thought I'd admit this, is was research methods. Um, I daily still pull from the fundamentals of research design. And I think that you know all study managers and in my role as a quality manager, we really need that basic understanding of you know the different types of studies. And you know, while we didn't necessarily learn this in the class itself, like the practices of from study startup to study end, what happens in between and developing a protocol. So all of that stuff, I think we all still pull from on a day to day. I always say to um, like the professional seminar class that we had to take where you had to work on interviewing and um, revising your resume, things like that. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to be prepared for interviews practice those behavioral questions, practice those situational questions, um, because it's it's very intimidating. When I even interviewed, after already interviewing at Merck, it never gets easier for me. Um, so I think that those two classes I still pull from and public speaking on a day-to-day. -day. And then to answer your second question, I personally liked the way that I did my my master's part time. Um, I was feeling really burnt out at, after my undergrad, and I don't know that I would have been happy to go straight through and without having a clear understanding of what I wanted to do. Because at that, when I graduated, I had an idea, but I wasn't entirely sure. Um, so I think doing a master's full time would have been a disservice to me because I think getting that work experience while completing my master's part time made it a little bit clear which direction I wanted to go. Um, but, but I think it's, it really is gonna depend on people's goals and what you aspire to do. Um, I've never done virtual learning, so I can't speak to it. I would think that you have to be a very motivated individual um, to really be sure that you're getting your work done and, and producing good work. And then also making sure that you're making those connections within the department. Yeah, I mean, I would just add, Alice, I totally agree. Research methods is the first one that came to my mind. Um, pull from it every day. I think, it, it, you know, it's, I can't underscore how important that that was. Also, epi and biostats, I think just having like a baseline understanding of what we're doing, what the outcomes look like, why they're important, why some things are more important than others is just helpful. It provides a lot of context to sort of like wrap your head around what we're doing and why we're doing it is, is really important. Um, and then in terms of the, you know, sort of what type of degree in person online, you know, I interview people all the time. I don't ever look at whether or not their degree was in person or online. That, you know, it, it's, I wouldn't even pay attention to that, I don't think. I'm really looking at what, what experience do you have? Um, does it align with the position? Is it gonna set you up for success in this role? And sure, the degree, if, it, if it's a minimum requirement for the position, it's important. Um, but I'm more focused on your experience and how you describe your experience on the role or on your resume. Yeah. Matt, and, staying, staying, I'm sorry, Claire, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I completely agree. I think uh, research methods. And then I just did want to point out the nice thing about um, the epi and biostats background that we have is that when we ultimately do finish a study, knowing what those uh, risk ratios, hazard ratios actually mean, um, it really at least for me, like it gives more weight to it and gives me a better understanding of the impact of my work, which is important to me personally. <laughs> I have my FBN and Biostats textbooks on the bookshelf behind me and I open them. <laughs> yeah, but, but, you, but I, I, don't, I don't see the temple mug visible this time. Okay. Oh, there it is. I'm sorry. It's, it's, uh... <laughs> he just got it out of the dishwasher for this call. <laughs> So, you know, Claire, I'm, I'm actually glad you said that because, um, you know, I, I think one, you know, I, I don't live, uh, you know, I live close to Merck's headquarters and a lot of people who live in my neighborhood work there. And, and you know, one of the things that I've just observed is for the people who, and, and in some cases they've been there for a long time, there is a tremendous sense of pride that comes with working on a, an agent or a disease state that you know, when, when you guys have a product that's making, 
people healthier and treating cancer. I mean, I, 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 you know, I see the twinkle in their eye when they talk about, you know, we, we've got this, we've got that, you know, whatever. And, and it's, um, you know, it's, it's clearly a sense of pride akin to, you know, when I publish a paper or something like that. And, and I think that that job satisfaction is, is, I'm glad you really brought that up. And, you know, the other thing that I've always been struck by, and it gets back to this idea of, you know, not, even though there's a career pathway, you don't necessarily know where it's going to go. But I've, you know, been in conversations with people saying, boy, you know, when I started 10, 15, 20 years ago, I had no idea that I would be sitting in the Ministry of Health in China talking about, you know, this, that, or the other. No, you know, nobody, if you would have tapped me on the shoulder saying, oh, you know, 20 years from now, you're going to be going all over the world talking about product X for this company and talking to high level government officials all around the world, you know, you, you might chuckle, um, but, but that's the reality for a lot of people. And so from, I think, both a professional and a personal perspective, it can be incredibly rewarding and a great sense of pride. Can, and we're, we've got about five minutes left, but we've got, we've got two other questions at least that are a little bit paired. Um, one of which is, and, and Matt, it kind of goes back to the coursework question. Um, are there specific field work experiences that all of you had that you think set you up nicely for a, a position in pharma? And then alternatively, for people who may be Alex, like, like you and like Matt, and, and actually Claire, you as well, for those of you who started off working on research projects in you know, academic settings, how do you then transition? How, you know, tell us a little bit about that transition to the industry side of the street. Yeah, I'm happy to kick it off. I think in terms of field work, I mean, mine were varied. I worked, I had a field work at a nonprofit. I had a field work in the Department of Public Health. I had a field work in academia. So I sort of like was trying to see what was the best fit for me. And I think I wouldn't say any were better or worse than another. I think they were all very different experiences that sort of like helped me see how different institutions work and understand just like different ways to get work done. Um, so I think I wouldn't say that there's like a gold standard for like a field work opportunity that you should pursue. Um, but I think a varied, varied experiences are really important just to get a sense of like what you like to do, what you don't like to do, that's probably more important. And then in terms of, you know, having sort of research positions before coming here, I, I don't know that it's necessarily like a hard and fast requirement to be successful in this role, but I do think it helps to understand when you're putting together a protocol, right? It's helpful to know like, well, we're asking people to execute these things, right? We're gonna give a site this protocol and say, collect this data for us. It's helpful to be able to think through like, what is it gonna take? What is somebody at the site level, the research coordinator, the PI, the research assistant, whoever, was it gonna take them to actually go collect this data, collect these specimens? How are they gonna process it? Think through it all is really helpful when just like, like Claire said, you know, we sort of like advise sometimes on protocol development to say, that's never gonna fly in the real world. Like that's, no one's ever gonna be able to do that, right? Having that boots on the ground experience, um, mm -hmm. I think gives us some credibility in the role that we have to speak up and people, you know, take our opinion seriously. I'll see if Alex and Claire, please add anything there. No, I agree with you, Matt. Um, I would say in terms of transitioning from academia to industry, there, there was certainly a learning curve, just trying to understand the various policies and regulations, but Merck expects that. And so never on day one are you expected to know everything. You know, they typically say nine months to get you where you feel comfortable and you have many mentors and buddies to really get you up to speed. So it certainly is a learning curve, but you're not alone in the process. And there's no expectation that you'd be an expert on week one. So Merck's a, they're a really reasonable company, I would say, and they're really supportive. Yeah, completely agree with both of you. Um, I can't speak to the field work aspect, but you know, my background wasn't necessarily in academic research um, or large pharma research before I came into this role. I really had to leverage my background working at a library, um, working at the Department of Health for a little bit and think about how those roles and experiences translated to what the roles at um, Merck were. And um, yeah, just another plug for transferable skills because it, it worked for me. I just took some time thinking critically about it. Yeah. 
So the last question, we've got several people who have chimed in on this and, and, I'm, and I know that it's happened previously too, but I think it's a great way to end. So for people who are interested in either exploring your summer internship program or looking at potential employment opportunities, what are good next steps for them? So I'll make a plug here. Um, my team, the quality team actually has a co-op position open right now. So it's designed for undergrad or graduate students. It is a six month position. So I think it's July to April. I don't know, whatever those six months would be. Full-time, fully paid. Um, the application closes at the end of April. So if anyone has interest in that, please reach out to me. Um, so that's my plug. In terms of employment, um, Merck's career website, you can go in there and put your interests, your degree, um, your, your work history, and they'll automatically send you an email with positions that match your keywords um, on a, I don't know, like weekly or bi-weekly basis. So I would recommend that. Yeah, and I'll just say that, you know, the summer internships, we post those positions, it's, we post them pretty far in advance. So I think they go up in October for the following summer. So we always share those, we always send them through to David, you and others um, at Temple. So, you know, look out for those. I, I guess they get posted on a career page somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, that's how you can get with those. And don't underestimate an external worker position, a contract position. Like I said, that's how I got started here. Um, it was, I thought it was a little bit risky. It's very common in the pharmaceutical industry. I think it gets looked down on a little bit in academia. Oh, you're, you know, you're just going to take a contract position, but it really is a good entryway into industry. So it's just another avenue for you to consider. Great. And I guess the, the one last thing that I would add to our students who are listening as we wrap this up, well, obviously this was a bit of a deep dive in with what goes on at Merck. And, you know, we're obviously hugely grateful for you willing to do this. You know, I think it's important that if people appreciate that this region of the country is actually yes. a hotbed for pharmaceutical companies and surgical device companies. And so, you know, there are many different companies in this space within about a two to three hour radius of Philadelphia. So whether you go up to Northern Jersey, New York, you start bleeding into Delaware and Maryland, you have a lot of these companies. And so for people with interests in this area, there's a lot to choose from. And, and I think people don't often realize that until they begin to you know, work at a company like Merck and find out, oh, you know, four of our competitors are within two hours of us. And you know, so we see them and so forth. So, um, so with that, as we're at the top of the hour, Alex, Claire, Matt, I wanna thank you guys again. Uh, as I alluded to in the beginning, you know, we've done this now a few times that you guys are not only family, but also friends. And we're, we're thrilled that you're willing to come back and share your expertise and experience with us. Um, you know, I, I'm getting text messages already from our faculty and students in my class saying this was great, this was fantastic. So I really, really appreciate you guys spending some more time with us. Um, you know, hopefully if we do this again next year, and I certainly would love to do this, maybe we get to be in person. Uh, which, would, which would be a nice, even though we've all gotten really good at this and it would force you guys to come out of your homes, but <laughs> it, would, it would be great. To, it'd be great to see you guys in person as well. Yeah. And I just want to just quickly plug that, you know, we're all happy to connect with your students that are on the call um, and those that are going to watch this recording. We'll share these slides with you all um, and our emails and our LinkedIn pages are uh, hyperlinked on here. So please connect with us on LinkedIn, reach out, introduce yourselves. You know, we're happy to have a conversation one on one. Um, if you're interested in that. So use your network. Great. Well, thanks again, guys. Um, I, 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 you know, it's been another great addition to our programming for National Public Health Week. And it's always great to hear and see you guys and see how things are, are progressing with all of you. So take care and we'll be in touch soon. Thanks so much. Thank Bye, you. Everybody. Bye.